I wasn't going because I believed in Jesus. I just was part of what was happening on the commune. Well, anyway, as I was saying, Ann and I had broken up and we were leaving. I was leaving the commune for parts unknown. And I guess Jonathan had heard that I was leaving. And he and Jeanette met me at the gate that morning. And as I was leaving, they pleaded with me. They said, Steve, will you receive Jesus to be your Savior before you go? Will you pray with us? We want to see you in heaven. We don't want to see you in hell. And I got a little upset. I said, you know, I said, I don't believe in Jesus, you guys. I said, I'm in the Eastern religion. And I said, Jesus was just a prophet, a teacher. He's dead now. And, you know, uh, they said, Steve, that's not true. He's alive. And you know, uh, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, I was pretty argumentative. I said, you know, I don't believe all of that. I said, I believe it's the same mountain. doesn't matter what side of the mountain you come up, the Christian side, the Buddha side, the, the Hindu side, the Jesus side, same mountain, all leading to the same place. And no, they tried to convince me, but I, I wasn't hearing it. I get in, you know, I get the dog in, I get what's left of my backpack in the back seat there, and and uh, we take off, and I look over, he's a 50, 55-year-old man, very straight, shirt and tie, short hair, clean-shaven man, looks like a businessman or something like that, and the guy is sobbing uncontrollably. I mean, just sobbing, you know. <laughs> he's trying to drive, and he's just sobbing, and I'm thinking, oh my God, another nutcase after this demonic dreadlock guy. This guy is as nuts as he is, and this guy's all over the freeway. He can't even drive. He's sobbing uncontrollably, and and I said to him, sir, I said, listen, uh, I said, can I help you? I said, listen, you want to pull over? I'll buy you a cup of coffee and, you know, we can talk. I said, uh, whatever's going on. I said, y you're not fit to drive. I'll be okay. Just give me a minute. I'll be okay. I said, sir, you're not okay. I said, please. I said, let's pull over. I'll be all right. Just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. I'll be all right. He's trying to drive, you know, and he's sobbing and and uh, I, I said, sir, please. I said, please, I, I, I don't feel safe. I said, you're not driving well. And, well, if you really want to know, I'm going to kill a man. And he reaches across the, the seat and he yanks this army blanket off the back seat with his hand. And in the back seat, he's got this army blanket, uh, a big thing of rope, a big butcher knife, and three concrete pier blocks like you put under a house foundation. They're about 25 pounds each got these three concrete pier blocks and he tells me how he's going to kill this guy that night wrap the body in the blanket with the pier blocks the concrete and when the rope and he's going to throw the body off Puget Sound and sink the body that night oh my god I'm in a car with a with a murderer you know my heart's pounding I mean I left off so let me start about September 1970 I had just done four years in the military. I had been in Vietnam for a year, uh, just been discharged uh, out of the U.S. Navy. I had been drugging a lot in Vietnam. Uh, just before I went into the service, uh, the hippie movement was starting in about 1966, and I, I had come in uh, on the shoulder period of the hippie movement, so I had already been kind of infiltrated by um, what was happening in Haight-Ashbury, and I had been smoking pot before I went into the Navy. And of course, in the four years in the Navy, I found everything from hashish to pot, and uh, people were sending me LSD in the mail, and so I was drugging pretty heavily in the Navy, and got through uh, my four years, got discharged. Well, when I got discharged in September of 70, uh, I dropped out almost immediately. I grew my hair long to my shoulders, had a huge beard, a four-inch brass ring in my nose, a big bull ring that went up in my nose, and two strings of dog's canine teeth necklaces uh, that I had uh, bought from a headhunting tribe in the Philippines years before. Um, so uh, I was uh, pretty radical, um, lived up on a hippie commune called Love Light Ranch in the hills of Sonoma running around naked up there uh, on the hippie commune and eating bulgur weed and macrobiotic diet and chanting my yogi chants and all of that, right? Had a girlfriend at the time. Um, when I first started sleeping with her, she was 13 and I was 23. I'm sorry for that. Uh, breaks my heart. 
Uh, that's what drugs will do to you. I married her when she was 16, and I was 26, and that ended in divorce rather quickly. But anyway, um, I was uh, with Anne during this period uh, up on the hippie commune. Well, we broke up, Anne and I, uh, and the way that um, I would handle my pain is I would hit the road with my dog in my backpack. And that's what I was about to do. I was about to take off for about a three-month journey north. I didn't know where exactly I was going, but um, my heart was broken again, and uh, my life was broken, <laughs> despite all of my um, religious searching. And believe me, I, I was a seeker. I had read the Bhagavad Gita. I had read the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I had studied with psychics. I was into astrology and had my horoscope uh, done by professional astrologers. I studied with Alan Watts for uh, two years uh, down in uh, Sausalito. I studied Buddhism with him. I uh, was part of Ananda Marga Yoga Society in Boys Hot Springs. I had my own guru. I had my mantra. I mean, I was reading Edgar Cayce, Khalil Gibran, um, all of that, uh, deeply steeped in Eastern religion, and an avid reader, and college educated, mind you. Um, and, you know, it was a profusely blooming spiritual desert out there, but there was no fruit, and I was badly disillusioned. Well, let me just divert from my leaving the commune for a minute. About a month before, uh, this couple moved up on the commune, um, a man named Jonathan Gainsborough and his girlfriend, Jeanette, soon to be his wife. Uh, he looked like a hippie, he had long hair and white muslin robes that he wore, and uh, they looked like the rest of us up there. Um, he asked if we could help build a cabin for him, and so the rest of the commune got together and built him a cabin in about a week or a week and a half, and he and Jeanette moved in. And... Uh, the first thing he said is that they were celibate. Well, I thought that was strange. I mean, they were sleeping in the same bed, and they were celibate. And nobody was celibate in the 70s. That was free love and all of that. Well, the second thing I noticed about him, one day I was in his cabin, and he had this big black Bible laying on his bed. And with some disdain, I said to him, you read that thing? And Oh, yeah, I read it. He said, Jeanette and I are born again. He said, we were camping by the banks of the Sacramento River in an assembly of God minister and uh, was camping there with his wife and they shared the gospel with us and we received Jesus and we were baptized in the Sacramento River. So Jonathan and Jeanette were saved about three months. That's all. Babes in the Lord, really. But definitely born again. So he started doing these little sing-alongs up on the commune with his guitar, and we were singing songs like, Will the circle be unbroken by and by, and I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. And in those days, it was kind of a shoulder period. Uh, many of you remember the Doobie Brothers um, musical group in the 70s, and they had a song out um, that went like this, Jesus is just all right by me. Jesus is just all right. And yeah, Jesus was all right, and Krishna was all right, and Buddha was all right, and so was Confucius. And, you know, everybody was doing their own thing. Well, in these sing-alongs uh, that Jonathan was leading, he'd share from the Bible. And he'd, you know, read a passage from the Bible. And in those days, there were hash pipes in the room, and Bibles, and people smoking joints, and reading their Bibles, and that was all all right. I mean, it was kind of that pre-Christian, before the big revival that happened in the 70s. So I was getting smatterings of the gospel from these sing-alongs, and I wasn't going because I believed in Jesus. I just was part of what was happening on the commune. Well, anyway, as I was saying, Ann and I had broken up, and we were leaving. I was leaving the commune for parts unknown, and I guess Jonathan had heard that I was leaving, and he and Jeanette met me at the gate that morning. And as I was leaving, they pleaded with me. They said, Steve, will you receive Jesus to be your Savior before you go? Will you pray with us? We want to see you in heaven. We don't want to see you in hell. And I got a little upset. I said, you know, I said, I don't believe in Jesus, you guys. I said, I'm in the Eastern religion. Uh, 
And I said, Jesus was just a prophet, a teacher. He's dead now. And, you know, uh, and they said, Steve, that's not true. He's alive. And, you know, uh, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, I was pretty argumentative. I said, you know, I don't believe all of that. I said, I believe it's the same mountain. doesn't matter what side of the mountain you come up, the Christian side, the Buddha side, the the Hindu side, the Jesus side, same mountain, all leading to the same place. And no, they tried to convince me, but I, I wasn't hearing it. And they said, well, okay, if you won't pray to receive Jesus, will you do this? Will you take this little Bible with you on your trip and will you read it? And they gave me a little Gideon's Bible. And I said, you know, this is what I hate about you Christians. I said, you want to push your stuff on everybody and it's like your way or the highway and you think you got the only truth and I said, listen, I, I care for you both. I said, you've got good vibes. I was into vibes, you know. I said, I'll take it, but I'm not going to read it. I said, out of respect for you too, I'll take it. And they said, well, uh, listen, if you get up to Seattle, there's this Christian commune up there. Jeanette and I have been up there, and they're good brothers. And if you need a shower or a place to stay, uh, they'll put you up. I said, hey, I'm not going to go to no Christian commune. I said, this, uh, that's the last place I'm going to go, but... So they wrote the address and they stuck it in that Bible and I put it in my shirt pocket. You know, one of those little green Gideon Bibles, you know, that they hand out on college campuses. And I didn't think anything of it. And I'm heading down the driveway and they said, hey, just one more thing. Uh, will you do this? If you won't pray to receive Jesus and you won't read the Bible, will you just do this? Will you pray to this Jesus you don't believe in? Just talk to him like you're talking to me. Tell him, Jesus, I don't believe you're alive. I don't believe you exist. But if you exist... And if you're alive, and if you show yourself to me beyond any shadow of a doubt, I'll give you my life. Will you do that? No, I wasn't going to do that either. I had an ounce of pot in my back pocket. I enjoyed sleeping with my girlfriend or anybody else I could for that matter. And I was superstitious enough to believe that if Jesus showed up, that uh, he might ask me to change a few things. And I wasn't willing to. That's the sin nature right there. I want to be my own God. Well, I took off. I'm hitchhiking up the coast, and I end up uh, up in Crescent City, about two or three days up the road, and I'm in a campground in Crescent City, and Jonathan's words just haunted me. You know, he said, will you pray to this Jesus? And if he's real, will you give him your life? You know, I had to ask myself a serious question. Uh, number one, are you a truth seeker? I thought I was a truth seeker. I was a voracious reader pursuing religion and all of its different forms. And, and I had to ask myself, honestly, if there is a truth that I didn't have, would I want it? Even if it cost me. What if Jesus was real? What if he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no man came but by him? So I wrestled with that that night in the campground. And I ended up calling Jonathan's bluff. I prayed to, to, to this Jesus. I said, Jesus, okay, listen. I said, I'm nobody's fool. I'm college educated. I'm smart. You know, you're going to have to really uh, show up beyond any shadow of a doubt. But if you do, and if you will convince me of your reality, I'll give you my life. Oh, my God, don't ever pray that prayer unless you mean it. From that moment, it was like the hounds of heaven were after me. Every car that picked me up, it seemed, was a Christian. They would preach to me, you know, and they'd get me in the car. Are you saved, brother? Do you know Jesus? And, you know, I'd pull out my little uh, Gideon's Bible, you know, my club card. See, yeah, I'm in the club. See here? I mean, I look like Charlie Manson or the creature from the Black Lagoon with this ring in my nose and this beard and long hair. It was obvious I was no Christian, but uh, they'd all preach to me, and they were so kind to me, and some, of them, some would give me a $20 bill, some would take me out to a meal, others would offer to let me stay at their home, and some of them I did, um, but I was so paranoid because almost every car seemed was Christian, and it got so bad, and I got so tired of being preached to that if I looked in the car and it was the Virgin Mary on the dashboard or a cross hanging from the mirror, <laughs> or a Bible in the car, I'd wave them on. I got so tired of everybody preaching at me, and I, I was paranoid almost. I mean, I'd search the car before I got in, make sure they weren't Christian. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, so I get up to eastern Oregon, and uh, many of you know that's desert out there in eastern Oregon, and it was very hot. It was like July and 103 degrees, right? 
I'm out there with my German Shepherd and my backpack. I had been hitchhiking on that uh, crossroad there for hours, it seemed, and just baking in the sun. And my poor dog was panting, and I had no water, no water for the dog. And I, this guy pulls up, and um, this guy pulls up in this black car, and all the windows are rolled up. Well, as many of you uh, may know, in 1970s there was no air conditioning, or they were just coming out with air conditioning in the 70s, and very few cars had air conditioning. Well, obviously this one did because <laughs> his windows were rolled up. And uh, I opened the door to get in and to thank him for the ride. And the first thing I noticed was this big black Bible on the seat. And I said, oh, my God, do I want to do this again? Do I want to do this again? And I was so hot and the poor dog was dying that I got in and uh, he uh, took off with me. And turned out he was an Assembly of God minister. And I rode with him for almost two hours across the Oregon desert. And he preached the whole gospel, all of it. Uh, just, of course, asking me if I was saved. And, of course, I tried to convince him I was. And he knew I wasn't and preached the whole gospel to me. Ah, gosh, horrible. Let me out um, somewhere by um, uh, Seattle, uh, below Seattle, somewhere below Seattle. And I had been at this on-ramp um, where he let me out for uh, a very long time. And it was getting dark. And uh, it was an inner city area just south of Seattle. And a lot of black people with wine bottles and brown paper bags. And yeah, I just felt uncomfortable. I mean, uh, I just felt uncomfortable there. It was a kind of a ghetto area and probably a high crime area. And it was starting to get dark. And, and uh, my option was to sleep at that on-ramp. And... God, I didn't want to be there. And I prayed my second prayer. I said, Lord, if you're real, uh, if you would just give me a ride, one on-ramp, I would be thankful. And this kid pulls up in this old station wagon, right? Old 56 Ford station wagon. And, uh, he's got dreadlocks, right? This guy with <laughs> dreadlocks. And nobody had dreadlocks in the 70s. I mean, that was the first guy I ever saw with uh, dreadlocks. And I was radical, but this guy was more radical than me, and I looked in his eyes, and right away I could see he was demonic or mentally ill, and now I believe demonic, and everything in me didn't want to get in that car. I mean, I could see he was crazy, and he had been living in this station wagon and throwing all his garbage into the back seat or into the back of the station wagon. There was rotting yogurt containers and banana peels and discarded food from fast food back there. The place smelled like a garbage truck. He'd been living in this car and throwing all his garbage in the back. The whole back seat was filled with garbage, as a matter of fact, because I remember putting my dog in there. And Right away, I said, man, I shouldn't ride with this guy. He's not well. And he got up on the freeway. And as many of you might know from travels up north, there's parts of Seattle where the freeway is 30 feet over the top of the city on stilts. And in some sections of that freeway, there's no on-ramp you can see from one end to the other. So he gets up on the freeway, up on the, the elevated portion, and he looks at me with these dove's eyes, these gentle deer's eyes, and he goes, so where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from Sonoma County. Then he flashes on me, damn you anyway, you son of a bee, and he starts cursing me, you know, <laughs> you MF and you this and that, and starts cursing me, and I said, whoa, you know, hey, cool it, man, what's going on with you? And then he get these dove's eyes again, you know, are you married? And I said, uh, no, I said, I'm single, I've got a girl, damn you anyway, you son of a gun, and he starts cursing me again, and he's all over the freeway, I mean, he's driving just erratically, and oh, my heart is pounding, I mean, I want to get out of this car at the very next on-ramp, you know, and this went on for about 10 minutes, him flashing back and forth between this gentle soul and this demonic, cursing, you know, vicious personality. And all of a sudden, he slams on the brakes right on the freeway. Ah, get out, get out, get out of this effing car. And he's kicking me with his foot. And get out, get the hell out of here. And, and now he stopped right in the slow lane. There's no bike lane. There's no pull off. There's nothing. He is in the slow lane right by the concrete railing of a three-lane freeway, and he kicks me out of the car, and he peels out and leaves me in a cloud of burnt rubber. I'm stuck on a one-foot curb. It's, it's not even a foot, eight-inch curb with my dog and my backpack and cars flying by at 50 miles an hour, and I'm trying to get my dog up on the curb so he won't get hit, 
and my backpack fell over and all my pots and pans went out into the slow lane and cars are running over my pots and pans and I'm trying to get my pots and pans or whatever I can get out of the slow lane and my dog is out in the second lane and the cars are swerving around him blowing the horn and oh god I'm just in this horrible position and I managed to get the dog and I drag him back to the railing and I took off my belt and I tied the dog to the railing with my belt and trying to gather what things I could and this guy sees me and he slams on the brakes and he skids to a halt. I mean, cars are going around him at 50 miles an hour, blaring the horn. He stopped in the slow lane on the freeway and I get in, you know, I get the dog in, I get what's left of my backpack in the back seat there and and uh, we take off and I look over, he's a 50, 55 year old man, very straight, shirt and tie, short hair, clean shaven man, looks like a businessman or something like that. And the guy is sobbing uncontrollably. I mean, just sobbing, you know, <laughs> he's trying to drive and he's just sobbing. And I'm thinking, oh my God, another nutcase after this demonic dreadlock guy. This guy is as nuts as he is. And this guy's all over the freeway. He can't even drive. He's sobbing uncontrollably. And and I said to him, sir, I said, listen, uh, I said, can I help you? I said, listen, you want to pull over? I'll buy you a cup of coffee and, you know, we can talk. I said, uh, whatever's going on. I said, y y you're not fit to drive. I'll be okay. Just give me a minute. I'll be okay. I said, sir, you're not okay. I said, please. I said, let's pull over. I'll be all right. Just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. I'll be all right. He's trying to drive, you know, and he's sobbing and... And uh, I, I said, sir, please. I said, please, I, I, I don't feel safe. I said, you're not driving well. And Well, if you really want to know, I'm going to kill a man. And he reaches across the, the seat and he yanks this army blanket off the back seat with his hand. And in the back seat, he's got this army blanket, uh, a big thing of rope, a big butcher knife, and three concrete pier blocks like you put under a house foundation. They're about 25 pounds each got these three concrete pier blocks and he tells me how he's going to kill this guy that night wrap the body in the blanket with the pier blocks the concrete and when the rope and he's going to throw the body off puget sound and sink the body that night oh my god i'm in a car with a with a murderer you know my heart's pounding i mean i'm at this point, I guess uh, 26, 25 years old, maybe. Uh, I guess a couple years going on since I'd gotten out of the service, just to give you a time reference here. My uh, girlfriend and I had broken up several times, you know, I'm about 25, I think. Uh, you know, looking back, my memory uh, fades with some of this, uh, time frames and all of that. So anyway, um, he's driving erratically and I'm speechless. I am speechless. I'm in the car with the murderer. I didn't know what to say. I reached in my pocket and I pulled out that little Gideon Bible that I'd never read. I had never looked at it even. I pulled it out and I just popped it open. I just looked at it. I just popped it open. And my eyes fell to a verse in Matthew or one of the Gospels. And I said to him, I said, sir, I said, Jesus said, peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. You think there's peace for somebody like me? I'm going to kill a man. I shut the Bible, you know, and my heart's just pounding. I don't know what to say, you know. I, I open the Bible again. I fall on a different verse. And I said, sir, I said, Jesus says here in the Gospels, he says, um, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. You think there's room for somebody like me in heaven? I'm going to murder a man. And I shut the Bible again, and he's driving erratically all over the freeway, and I mean, the Holy Spirit is working through me for this man, and I'm not even saved. I don't even know Jesus, but God loved this guy. And as I'm reading the scriptures to him, he starts to get control, and he agrees to pull off. And in those days, they had Sambo's restaurants, and we pulled off into a Sambo's off the freeway on-ramp, and he begins to pour his heart out to me. He's the father of a young man who shared my name. His son's name was Stephen. His son was 26. I was about 25. Um, his son was a hippie like me. That's why he picked me up. Um, his son was doing 10 years in the Washington State Penitentiary for sale of narcotics. Well, apparently his son had been living out on Victoria Island with the Filipino woman who was one of the largest heroin dealers in the Seattle area. The narcotics agents had been staking out the house for quite some time. 
and they did a bust on the house when she happened to be out and they caught his son with a loaded revolver, 10,000 of cash, which in 1970 was a lot of money, or 72, I guess, 73. So a lot of money, 10,000, and all these kilos of heroin. So they had put everything on his son. Well, this was the father that had picked me up, who had lost his marriage over the stress of this, had mortgaged his house, and had cashed in his retirement to get money for lawyer after lawyer and appeal after appeal to try to keep his son from going to prison. And he had lost the final case, and his son was doing 10 years, and he was going to kill the judge that had incarcerated his son. He was so consumed with bitterness. He had already been up to the judge's house. He knew where the bedroom was. He was going to climb up the the toilet drain pipe on the outside of the house, uh, slip in the second story window at night, and kill him in his sleep, and lower the body down with the rope and take it out to Puget Sound. Well, as I'm in Sambo's and ministering to him, <laughs> me who is not born again, I'm ministering to him, guess what falls out of that Bible? That slip of paper that I had totally forgotten about that Jonathan had put in there about this commune up on Queen Anne Hill. And I said to him, for lack of better words, I was no Christian. I didn't even know what a Christian was. But I said to him, I said, I'm a baby Christian. I don't know anything about the Bible. But I said, if you'll come with me to this place, I know these people can help you. And this poor broken man came with me. I couldn't believe it. And it's about 6.30 p.m. now, 7 p.m., twilight. It's getting twilight. We drive up the Queen Anne Hill. We find the place. Five Victorian homes, three on one side of the street, two on the other, all freshly painted in this ghetto area. But you could see these five homes were all painted and had beautiful ornamental gardens in the front. And some hippies working out front, you know, in the garden as the last of the sun's rays were there. And I said, this must be the place. And it was. Uh, we asked if we could come in and talk with someone. And they invited us in for dinner. Uh, that night we had dinner together with live music at the table. And after dinner, they shared the gospel with this man and he got saved and came to Jesus. They baptized him in the backyard that night in a clawfoot tub that was sunk in the ground with tiki torches and a choir and all this is beautiful, beautiful manifestation of the Lord. He came to Jesus, gave his son into the hands of God and turned around and went home a healed man uh, with peace all over his life. I had never seen a life transformed. That first life I had seen transformed by the Lord. I stayed in the commune for two weeks. Do you think I would receive Jesus? Absolutely not. They preached to me every day. Every day they preached to me from the Word of God. I was a good guy. I mean, I baked bread for them. I washed floors. I cleaned toilets. They loved me. They wanted me to stay. They said, you're one of us. I said, I'm not one of yours. I'm not one of you. I don't believe that Jesus is the only way. I just couldn't believe it. I left there. They cried when I left there. So now I'm uh, just north of Seattle somewhere, and I'm hitchhiking, and this guy picks me up, and he says, where are you going? I said, oh, wherever you're going, I have no destination. And he said, well, you may not want to go where I'm going. He said, I own a ranch up on a one-lane mountain road, and I'm going up to my ranch. And I said, well, I got nowhere to be, nowhere to go, so let's go. Fine with me. Well, I'm thinking, right, he's going to put me up at his house because a lot of people did, especially if it was late in the evening. And it was getting late, you know, in the evening. It was about uh, 7 p.m. when he picked me up. Uh, you know, had long, long summer daylight in, in the July. But, yeah, he picked me up and we're talking and we get on this one-lane mountain road, two or three miles up this mountain road. And I'm hoping he's going to ask me to stay for the night and, uh, get to his uh, driveway, and he goes, well, here's where you get out. He said, this is where I live. I'll see you later. I said, oh, C-R-A-P, excuse my language. I was in the middle of nowhere, and this guy is kicking me out, and he's not asking me to stay, and I'm in the middle of nowhere now, and worse even yet, it's starting to drizzle, and it looks like rain. So I get out of his car, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do? It's going to rain, you know, and 
So I remember this railroad trestle back about a mile, uh, half a mile before his gate. There was this railroad bridge, and I'm thinking I could find shelter under there, maybe a dry place to camp for the night. So I'm walking back uh, down the road, you know, to the railroad trestle, and there's all these papers all over the side of the road. They're all fluorescent colors, fluorescent pink, fluorescent orange, fluorescent green, fluorescent yellow, all these 8 by 10 papers, and... I'm thinking, man, you better get some of these papers before they get wet, because uh, if you want to have a fire tonight, you better grab as many of these as you can. And there was, you know, 50, 100 of them all blown all over the road. Maybe they came off a truck, they blew off a truck or whatever. I don't know, but I gathered this big armload of all these papers. I don't know how many I picked up, you know, 50 of them, something like that. So I get down to the railroad trestle, and sure enough, here's a campsite with a fire ring, and it's dry under there, and... So uh, me and the dog and the backpack, you know, we get set up and I start crumpling up these papers to make a fire. And guess what? They're all Bible tracts, different varieties. There must have been 10 or 20 different Bible tracts, all printed on big, low paper, right? So I'm sitting there all night with my flashlight reading Bible tracts, right? And looking up scriptures in my little Bible that I had that I'm all of a sudden uh, a little interested in. You know, I had seen enough that made me think that maybe this Jesus was real, you know. <laughs> I mean, it took a lot. I was a hard nut to crack, you know. I just wasn't going to come down easy. So the next morning, I, I hiked back up the hill, uh, past his driveway, down the other side of the mountain. And I got down to this little uh, one-pump gas station general store, and I have to use the bathroom. So I'm sitting in the stall uh, in the bathroom, and I look over to my left. And on the wall of the bathroom, somebody had written John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm going, my God, this has got to be, is this coincidence? All these Christians that picked me up by the Bible tracks, the, the murderer. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I had asked Jesus if he was real to show himself to me, right? I, you know, starting to, pieces are falling together here, right? Whether I like it or not. So anyway, I take off again. Now I'm up to uh, uh, Vancouver, uh, Canada. And I'm looking for a place to sleep. And there's a big park up there called Stanley Park. So, um... Uh, I'm looking for some trees that I can camp in in Stanley Park, big park, like Golden Gate Park, San Francisco, great big park up there in Vancouver. And I heard this music uh, coming over the hill. So I kind of go over this hill, uh, and here's this amphitheater with about 500 people. It's about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, and there's a stage down there, and obviously there's some sort of a concert going on, and so I sit down with my dog, and I'm listening to this concert. Well, it was a Christian concert, and the different people are getting up to the microphone playing Christian songs on their guitar and telling how Jesus healed their marriage and how Jesus delivered them from drugs and people giving testimony and playing Christian music. And wow, I mean, I God had my attention big time by now, and I'm listening, you know. So they were just closing up about 5 o'clock. They were going to close, and they said, well, we're just about to shut down for the afternoon, and we're going to open up the stage here like an altar. If anybody would like to come down and pray, we're going to open up the stage. Well, hey, listen, I wanted to pray. I really did. I had seen a lot, you know. I mean, I'd been through a lot, you know, going through all this breakup with Anne and this murderer and all this stuff. I'd seen a whole lot, and I wanted to pray. I didn't want anybody messing with me. I just wanted to go down and pray, you know, to whoever God was. So... I tied my dog to a tree and I'm heading down and other people are going down and I figured they're just people like me that were in the park that Sunday that had heard this concert. Wrong. <laughs> no, they were their guys all scattered among the audience and as I'm going down, two guys grabbed me, one on each arm in an arm lock and they were radical Pentecostal a group up there called the Seattle Jesus People's Army, and they grabbed me one on each arm, and, whoa, Jesus, hallelujah, sandarabashu, and they're praying in tongues, and they've got me in this arm lock, and, oh, my God, I freaked out, I threw them off me, I start running, I started running through the park, I mean, I, I had had it with God and the devil and murderers, and, oh, God, I was so scared, and I had never heard anybody speak in tongues, and, I didn't come back until like 7 p.m. after they had packed up every amplifier and every instrument. They were all gone. I didn't want to be messed with. I didn't want these Christians getting a hold of me again. And 
to, much to my surprise, my dog was still tied to the tree and my backpack was still there. I mean, uh, I was drugged enough that I, I left the dog in the backpack and didn't come back for several hours, you know. They were still there. So now I'm heading across uh, Canada. I'm over in Clinton, British Columbia, out in the Canadian desert out there, and I'm sleeping in a laundromat out there. And, and it's raining. I'm out in the laundromat, and it's raining. And 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm up on the changing table, sound asleep in my sleeping bag. And this couple comes in about 2 in the morning and wakes me up and asks me to get off the changing table so they could fold their laundry. I thought that was kind of rude. They'd wake me up, but I got up and... You know, uh, I start telling them this story that I'm telling you and sharing everything with them that I'm sharing with you. And I said, you know, I said, I just don't believe that Jesus is the only way. I said, what about all these millions of people that follow Muhammad and Krishna and all these good people that are religious and uh, same mountain? Every path leads to... Well, they said, you know, we believe what you believe, Steve. They said, we're Baha'is. They were Baha'i elders, mind you. And these were Baha'is <laughs> times 10. They said, we're Baha'i elders, and they said, we believe in the Baha'i faith that every thousand years, God sends a, an avatar. And uh, they had this chart, they had a briefcase, and just like the JWs, they had all their material in their briefcase, and they're showing me this chart, you know, and how every thousand years, here comes Krishna, and Confucius, and Buddha, and Jesus, and then Muhammad, and then their guy, you know, Baha'u'llah, in 1880 in Persia, their guy, their Messiah, Baha'u'llah. And he had a guy called the Bob, B-A-B, that was like John the Baptist that was a forerunner before the Bob. And I said, hey, that's what I believe. Man, you guys got it. I, this is this makes sense. Uh, I believe this too. You guys, uh, this is what I've been looking for, you know. So forget Jesus. I invited Baha'u'llah to be my savior. I prayed to receive Baha'u'llah. And they took me home and I stayed with them several days at their house and they played Seals and Croft music for me, these wonderful songs about love. Seals and Croft are Baha'is. I don't know if you guys knew that, but they are. And I was totally convinced I had found the way, the truth, and the life, and it was Baha'u'llah. I mean, Jesus was a historical figure. Baha'u'llah was recent, and he's the guy. And they loaded me down with Baha'i books and literature. And from there, all the way home, for the next month and a half, I stayed in Baha'i homes, stayed in all Baha'i homes, and we're... By the time I got back, and I'd been gone about three months now, uh, I was totally on fire for the Baha'i faith. So I called my girlfriend, Ann, and uh, I didn't go back up to the commune at that point. I, I rented a little house in, Boys Hot, in uh, Glen Ellen uh, so I could be closer to my girlfriend uh, that I wanted back. And I said, Ann, I've found it. It's Baha'i. This is what it is. Now we can get back together and make our relationship work because now I found the truth and and so uh, she did get back together with me, and, and she was about uh, yeah, 15 at that point in time, I guess, um, trying to make sense of it all. Uh, so we got back together, and uh, she was still living at home, but coming over, you know, and sleeping with me, you know, several nights a week, still in my sin. Started going to the Baha'i Temple there in Boys Hot Springs, and it was nothing but a coffee clatch. I mean, there was no truth. They would read from the Baha'i books and people were smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee. And oh my God, I was still smoking cigarettes too and into porn and I smoking dope too. And nothing was changing. And Anna and I broke up again. Oh my God, Anna and I broke up again. Well, at this point, uh, I was so devastated that uh, I wanted to find this Jonathan, this Jewish guy that at first challenged me to believe in Jesus. So I went back up to the commune. And um, when I got up there, you know, Jonathan's house was burned to the ground, uh, just nothing but ashes. And, and I went to the owner of the property and his house was burned to the ground also. And I thought that was really strange. And I, you know, went to some of the other people on the commune and I said, hey, what happened to uh, Jonathan Gainsborough? I said, what happened to the Christians that were up here and they said oh they wanted to preach that Jesus stuff to everybody and they said uh, we kind of uh, drove them off the commune he said I think they're all living down in Boys Hot Springs in some rented house uh, on Park Avenue they're all living together uh, Jonathan was telling everybody that they shouldn't run naked anymore and they should believe in Jesus and he said a bunch of them did and I think that's where they're at down there and so um 
I found the place, uh, and uh, Jonathan Gainsborough, and Richard Paradise, and um, uh, John Elig, and several people were living at this little house, living communally down in Boy Springs, and they told me that they were, you know, following some old man up on top of Sonoma Mountain that had a church up there, and, uh, a Jim Swallow, a 95-year-old patriarch that loved the Lord, and they told me that that's where they were going to church up there. So I don't know how I got up there. Uh, I don't know. I uh, can't, uh, things are sketchy back that far, but uh, started going up to Sonoma Mountain, uh, and you, it would take you a map, and even with a map, you couldn't find this place. Forget any ideas about location, location, location for a church. This church, you had to go through people's backyards and cattle guards, cattle guards and open gates to about a mile and a half up a dirt road on top of Sonoma Mountain. So I started going up there. And now, mind you, I'd been gone, you know, several months. Well, by the time I got up there, there was a thriving hippie church, you know, 50 people, maybe more. I don't know. Uh, uh, following this old man, and he looked like Moses, and he had this long white beard and these blue eyes, and 95-year-old saint patriarch that just loved Jesus, and he was preaching in this old metal building up there with theater seats, old uh, wooden theater seats for, that was the church, this old tin building, corrugated steel, and after church, they'd have potlucks, and there'd be banjos and fiddles and bluegrass music and potluck lunches and uh, all these hippies up there, a uh, hippie church following this old man. And boy, it was a beautiful organic scene, you know, just a semi-communal. Some people were living up there in different trailers and houses. And ah, I liked what was happening. I still wasn't interested in Jesus, mind you. I still did not believe Jesus was the only way. No, 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 no. I did not believe that. But I was into the vibes. There was good vibes up there and all this music. I started going, well... Every week, Jim Swallow would come after me. He'd see me, and he'd come across the lawn after church, and he'd say, Steve, what's taking you so long? He said, you've heard of Jesus. I, you've heard the gospel. Why? Are, it's, I said, Jim, I love you guys, but I said, I'm not into this Jesus stuff. And I said, please don't pressure me. I won't come up anymore if you do that. Well, week two, he'd come after me. Same thing. What's taking you so long, Steve? Week three. Week four. He's coming after me again. Well, by week five, I'm getting mad. I mean, I'm really mad. And here he comes across the lawn after me again. I know the whole routine. He's going to pressure me and do this thing. And I'm backing up and I'm throwing up my hands and I'm saying, Jim, if you do this, I'm not going to come up anymore. And I'm backing up. He's advancing and I'm backing up. And unbeknownst to me, there was a redwood tree behind me and I, I backed into the redwood tree and that's what stopped my retreat from him. And he fell on me, just fell on me. He threw his arms around me and he started weeping over me. I mean, just sobbing, weeping. And nobody had ever wept over me, not my mother, not my father. And nobody had ever cared for my soul enough to weep over me. And he starts to pray that Jesus would open my eyes. And he's crying and he's hugging me like a man grab a, a, a buoy in the middle of the ocean. He wouldn't let go. And and he's praying that Jesus would open my eyes. And all I can tell you, saints, at that point, the Holy Spirit hit me so hard that all of a sudden he was transformed. And it wasn't him. It was Jesus that had me. Jesus' his arms were around me. And I started screaming at the top of my lungs, I know it's you. I know it's you. And I'm bursting into tears. And I know it's you. I wasn't talking to him. I was talking to the one that was holding me, and that was Jesus. I mean, it was as real as this table. Jesus was the one, not him. It was mystical. It was magical. It was amazing. Jesus had me. And like a slideshow, he showed me my life, how he had answered that prayer, how the, the, the tracks I found, the murderer, the people that fed me. I just started sobbing, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, Jesus, forgive me. And I know it's you, I know it's you. And then it was like a backpack fell off when I said, forgive me, this backpack that I'd been carrying for 26 years of sin and guilt. I mean, I had committed adultery with people's wives. I had stolen money from my parents. I had, I had done every sin imaginable that you could think of from fornication to, I mean, I, I, when that backpack of sin fell off, I felt like I was, had had an internal bath. I mean, I was born again. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. They took me up and baptized me. Jim Swallow was, 
I, I think I was the last baptism he did. He was getting so old that some of the others didn't want him to get in the tank with me, but I was the last one he baptized. And, you know, I then I got back together with Anne, and, you know, she got baptized, and uh, I thought she was saved, and we were going to follow Jesus. Um, but our relationship, it wasn't of God, and shortly after that, uh, our marriage fell apart, and uh, we were divorced. And after that, I remained single and celibate, for seven years, I walked with the Lord after that. And uh, that's the end of the story until I married Debbie. You know, seven years later, I, I was a solid brother in Christ. I followed Jesus as I do today. And uh, Debbie was the one God had ordained for me. Uh, you know, Anne was my own pick. <laughs> it wasn't the Lord. She was 16 when we married. And a very, uh, you know, tortured soul, you know, had grown up without a real father or mother. And you know, years later, I found out she had married several times more and had some children, and, you know, her life had not turned out well. And uh, I was able to meet with her, actually, and, and ask her forgiveness for, you know, my own improprieties as a man of God with her. But uh, anyway, that's my story, and I just wanted you to have it. Uh, Jesus is real. He'll do the same for you that he did for me. Just don't be so hard. Don't Don't be like I was. The, God says in the Bible, do not be like a like a bull or an ox that I have to put a ring in your nose and lead you in order to get you to follow me. He said, uh, just let me put my eye upon you. So uh, that's my prayer for you today, whoever you are that's hearing this. He's good. He's gentle. He's kind. Give your heart to him. It's a wonderful life. I've had a wonderful life. Wonderful life. Yeah, as I said, I'm going into this major surgery. I may live, I may die. doesn't matter. I've had a wonderful life and I know my Savior. God bless you. Bye-bye.